Praise the Lord. Amen. Shall we rise up as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you very much. We thank you because you brought us to the Bible study. Thank you because it's always a great time to study at the feet of the Lord Jesus. And thank you for your spirit. You always give us enlightening us and throwing light on the word of God. Lord Jesus, we pray. As we come together for the Bible study tonight, open eyes of understanding in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, as we study and we learn about the new earth and the new heaven and the new Jerusalem. We pray, O oh Lord, you grant us a desire to be there in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, anything within, without, around, above, beneath that will drag us away from this glorious land. Take it away from us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that the desire and the thirst, the longing to always look up to you and to be in heaven at last, this longing and desire will never be quenched in Jesus' name. Bless your people tonight as we study together. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God bless you. You can be seated. We're coming very close to the end of all things in the study of the book of Revelation. And at the last, at the consummation of all things, that is after the final judgment of all sinners and all rebels, we will have now the description of the happy state of the righteous. As you turn your Bible with me, please open to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 1. Today we're looking at verses 1 through to 8. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride had done for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and, be there, and he will be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right. For these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable, and the murderers, and all mongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, shall, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. As we come to this passage today, I want to remind you, when we started in Revelation chapter 1, we saw the picture of the glorified Christ. And then in chapters 2 and 3, we have the story of the church. Actually, that's the church age, the period of the church. And then in chapters 4 and 5, you have the glory of the, of the Lamb of God and the glory of the Father himself sitting upon the throne. You see that rainbow around the throne and the thunders and the, and the lightnings coming out of the throne. What the voices did you hear about the singing and about the joy of the elders around the throne as they said blessing and glory and honor unto the Lamb and to the God of heaven, because he has redeemed us and he has washed us white in his blood. And now we are before the Lord because of his salvation he has given unto us. But after chapter 5, then comes the great tribulation. And the period of the great tribulation is actually the period of judgment, judgment upon the world. And if you see the first line in your outline, it says, at last, at the consummation of all things, after the final judgment of all sinners and all rebels now we have the description of the happy stage of the righteous before we go to this happy stage of the righteous i want you to understand once again first of all there is the judgment of sinners 
before there will be the joy and the jubilation of the saints. And as we talk about the judgment of sinners, we're talking about it in relation to the great tribulation. But please understand, number one, before the great tribulation, there was judgment. During the great tribulation, there will be, be judgment. And then after the great tribulation, there will be judgment. Before the great tribulation, what period is that? That's the church age, the period of the church. And we're told in Revelation chapter 2, open your Bible with me, Revelation chapter 2, in verses 19, all through to 23. And when you're in Revelation chapter 2, chapter 3, you're actually in the church age, the period of the church. And here is the time before the great tribulation. Revelation chapter 2, verse 19, I know thy words and charity and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last will be more than the first, notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into a great into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am He which searches the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. And so we find there judgment, judgment within the church. Judgment of members of the church that were not living according to the precepts, the commandments, the, the declaration of the Lord. That was before the great tribulation. But then, during the great tribulation, true, there will be great judgment. And as you come to chapter 6 of Revelation, chapter 6 of Revelation, I'm reading, I'm reading from verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, and there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of air, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casted her untimely figs, when she is shaking of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, every mountain and isle and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. And hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? That, was at the, that will be at the beginning of the great tribulation. As the seals are open, then you have judgment coming upon the people of the earth at that time. And in fact, they say, this is the great day of the wrath of the Almighty God. And who shall be able to stand? And as the tribulation progresses, then you have a lot of calamities coming upon the people of the world at that time. All the people who do not have their names written in the book of life. Then he tells us in Revelation chapter 14, reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 14 verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is falling, is falling. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And so you find that during the great tribulation, there will be judgment upon the people too. In Revelation chapter 18, I'm reading to you from verse 6. Revelation chapter 18. Reading from verse 6. Reward her even as she rewarded you. And double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she has filled, fill to her double. 
how much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously, delicately so much, so much torment and sorrow give her. But she has said in her heart, I see it as a queen, and I'm no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burnt with fire. For strong is the Lord God who, has, who judges her. And then he tells us in verse 9. And the kings of the earth who has committed fornication and lived deliciously, delicately with her shall bewail her and lament her. For when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off. For the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And now eventually you come to the end of the great tribulation. And at the end of the great tribulation, now we have, after the great tribulation, still judgment again. Revelation chapter 20, reading from verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And so we find number one before the great tribulation, judgment. Number two, during the great tribulation, judgment number three after the great tribulation judgment now with the final judgment over and all the sinners and all the rebels have been cast into the lake of fire now we have the description of the stage of the righteous the saints the redeemed of the lord those who have been watched in the blood of the lamb these righteous want to forever live in the presence of the almighty god here we come talking about the joy the jubilation and the jubilee of these people of god we come now to revelation chapter 21 and john is still following through as john is seeing the revelation the lord is showing him and i john and i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and i john saw the holy city new jerusalem coming down out coming down from god out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and i heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of god is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and god himself shall be with them and god shall be their god he will be their god here we now have the revelation of what will happen on the final day after the people of god those who are washed in the blood of the lamb and those who have been born again with the evidence and the testimony of the spirit of god in their hearts that they are the children of god and they're, they're new creatures in christ if any man be in christ is a new creature all things are passed away and behold all things have become new all those people that continue in the lord in that experience of salvation in that experience of the new birth in that experience of the new life in christ until the very end this is where they will end up and john must remember at this time what jesus had told them before he lived in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you unto myself so that where i am there ye may be also and now the culmination has come and the reformation or the renewal or the renovation of the earth is coming at this time that john is seen is telling us that when all the conflict shall have ceased and when all the rebels and the reprobates shall have been damned, the revelation of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem will become a reality. The atmospheric heaven that is the heaven you see when you look up. 
that is the heaven of the stars where the birds fly and the clouds float all that will pass away the heaven of the stars and the vast universe will all be changed and then there will be a new heaven created by God and that will take the place of the heavens and the earth that have passed away this old earth caused by sin this whole earth, blighted and stained with the blood of the innocent, will also pass away and will be replaced with the new earth. The new earth will not be infested with teasels and thorns and briars. It will not be stained with sin or the blood of the innocent. It will be Eden restored. It will be paradise regained. A new earth indeed. The new heaven and the new earth will be the final abode of the blessed. The final abode of those who have been blessed with the blessing of salvation, or the blessing of the new birth, or the blessing of righteousness in Christ, or the blessing of being cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. That shall be the final abode, the new heaven and the new earth, and that new Jerusalem, the final abode of the people of God. John also saw this new Jerusalem. That will be the capital city made by the glorious workmanship of our infinite Lord. This heavenly holy city will be the center of God's government. God's people will dwell there and God himself will dwell among them. The overcomers will inherit all things. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son. I pray you will be there. Yeah. We're looking at the study and we're going to go into in-depth study. We divide it to three parts. Number one, the glorious picture of the new Jerusalem. The glorious picture of the new Jerusalem. Number two, godly people in the new Jerusalem. Only godly people will be there. Unrighteous people will not be there. Ungodly people will not be there. Sinners will not be there. Rebels and reprobates will not be there. Backsliders who persist in their backsliding will not be there. But that new Jerusalem will be for godly people. Godly people in the new Jerusalem. Number three, graceless people, godless people excluded from the new Jerusalem. We go to point number one. Glorious, the glorious picture of the new Jerusalem. Please come back to Revelation chapter 21. We're looking at verse 1, all through to verse 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God in what I've read to you we'll see the picture of the new Jerusalem we see the picture of that holy city, that heavenly city, where the people of God will be for all eternity. And John said, I saw it. It's a new heaven. And it's a new earth. And I saw that holy city, New Jerusalem. And it's coming from the very presence of God. A great transformation will take place. A great renovation will take place. And the new heaven, the new earth will totally, completely, forever be new. Because the first heaven, according to what we read here, and the first earth will, be, will pass away. That means the present universe, that is the earth, the globe, everything that you see, the land and the sea. And then when you look up, the stars and the clouds and everything, they will all be rolled up and removed and changed, recreated, renovated. There will be a renovated universe to take the place of the one that's gone. How do we describe this? As you look at this Revelation chapter 21, look at verse 1, it says, And I saw a new earth and a new heaven, and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Then it tells you what will not be there. It says, there, there was no more sea. In the earth in which we are living now, the seas and the oceans occupy about three quarters of the surface of the globe, limiting the number of inhabitants on earth. But in the new heaven, the new earth, there will be no more sea. 
everywhere will be habitable. And all the righteous will enjoy a perfect state and there will be perfect perpetual intimacy with the Almighty God throughout eternity. Not only that, look at verse 22. And I saw no temple there. It tells us there will be no sanctuary there. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Then in verse 23 it says, And the sea had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, nor to shine in it. For the glory of God did light in it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And then in verse 4, you come back to verse 4, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away and then in verse 27 and there shall be no in no wise there shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever walketh abomination nor maketh a lie but they which are reaching in the Lamb's book of life. Come back to verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God shall be with them, and be their God. There will be no separation from God. We will be with God all throughout eternity. Let me summarize all those verses I've read to you. Number one, there will be no sea. Number two, there will be no sanctuary. Number three, there will be no sun, neither moon also. Number four, there will be no sickness, there will be no pain, there will be no death. Number five, there will be no sorrow or sadness. Number six, there will be no sin that will enter there. Nothing defiling will ever enter that new Jerusalem. Number seven, there will be no separation. Now number eight, there will be no sinner there. No separation from God for the people that are godly, for the people that are righteous, for the people who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And there will be no sinners there. And thank God Satan will not be there also. Give me a good amen. amen. And so we learned about this glorious picture of the new Jerusalem. And actually we need to understand it wasn't just John alone that saw this. There have been prophets and priests and people in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament that saw this far ahead of time. And they knew that the time will come when the sinners will be judged. And then the people of God, they'll go into this that has been called paradise or has been called uh, the Eden restored or has been called the very abode of the Almighty God, has been called the holy city or the holy hill where the children of God, the people of God will be all throughout eternity. Uh, let's look at the revelation of the word of God. Isaiah chapter 65. In Isaiah chapter 65, I'm reading from verse 17. Isaiah 65 verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the, form, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. That's why I told you it wasn't just John alone that saw this. The prophets before him had seen this. The servants of God before him had seen this. And the Lord had opened their eyes to see that a time will be coming. When the present earth will be rolled up, folded up, and then will be disposed of, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Then we're told in verse 18, But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her not the voice of crying exactly what we're reading in the book of revelation only that john saw it now painted before him coming down before him jerusalem the new jerusalem coming from heaven in isaiah chapter 66 verse 22 isaiah chapter 66 i'm reading from verse 22 for as the new heavens and the new earth which i make which i will make shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain. The Lord was telling the children of Israel that the new heaven was coming and the new earth will be coming to you. 
that should be the new Jerusalem and it will remain forever with him. That when this old earth is folded up and thrown away and destroyed, but the new earth will remain forever because that will be the abode of the people of God, the children of God. In 2 Peter chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 13. 2 Peter chapter 3, we're reading from verse 13. Let's go back to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. This old earth, everything will be burnt up. The property you see there, and the things you see there, and the things that the people of the world are dying for. All those things will be burnt up. He tells us in verse 11, it says, See in them that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought he to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. When it says the heavens being on fire, it's talking about what we have talked about. That he is the starry sky. That he is the sky that you see and the stars. And that means that all the clouds, everything will be folded up. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That means the element of the earth. Then in verse 13, nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent. That ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. As you read all over the scriptures, whether you're reading the Old Testament or you're reading the New Testament, the revelation of the word of God is very clear that this old earth will be burnt up. God will get rid of this, fold it up, dispose of it, and it will not be any longer. But then you have the new heavens and the new earth. And there will be righteousness there. And only the righteous, the saints of God, those who are saved and sanctified, watch in the blood of the Lamb. Those are the people that are going to be there. And Peter then gives us a watch of counsel. A watch of encouragement. Saying, see that this is the promise we are looking for. How we ought to make ourselves ready. If you are not new, you cannot be in the new Jerusalem. If your mind is not renewed, if your heart is not renewed, if your life is not renewed, if your marriage is not renewed, if your relationship is not renewed, if you're not a new creature in Christ, nothing old of the old nature, of the sinful nature, of the polluted nature, of the canon nature, will be allowed to dwell in that new Jerusalem. But the people who are new and renewed by the blood of the Lamb, those are the people that are going to be there. That's why Peter is telling us, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, it says, we, according to his promise, we're looking for the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Then it says, wherefore, because of that, beloved, seeing that you are looking for such things, be diligent, not careless, not haphazardly, not taking the things of God with loose hands, not taking your salvation, your holiness, or sanctification with careless hands, but diligently, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Uh, we read in Revelation chapter 21. Let me go back there again and, and make you see what we're talking about. And it's in verse 1. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Let me remind you once again that that wasn't anything new. The first heaven, the first earth, passing away. If you look at Psalm 102, Psalm 102, from far back in the Old Testament, the people had been told, all that you see now, all the things that are tangible, all the things you're looking at, everything will eventually pass away. Psalm 102, verse 25. Of old, has thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hand. They shall perish. That's it right there. The earth and the heavens, they, they shall perish. But thou endurest, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. And as a vesture shall thou change them. 
and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. It tells us very clearly then that the earth you see now, the earth you stand upon now, and the earth upon which many people labor, and that's the only thing they labor for, that everything is going to pass away. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, as lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands, they shall perish. But thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. Verse 12. And as a vesture shall thou fold them up, and it shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Here we learn then that what we see in everything you see, everything will pass away. But then we're told there's something else coming. And let's come back to Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, it tells us, And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for us man. And I had a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God shall be with them, and will and be their God. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh now out of heaven from, from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Do you see the anticipation of the people of God? Christ has spoken about it at the time of the church age. Because when you are in chapter 3, chapter 2 of, of Revelation, you are in the church age. At the time of the church age, the Lord has spoken about it. You keep on overcoming, overcome temptation, overcome sin, overcome the world, overcome your own passion, overcome your own carnality, overcome the suggestions of the devil to you, overcome the tendency to backslide. And when you overcome, the Lord Jesus said, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God. And then you will not go out anymore. And it says, I will write upon you my new name. And the name of the new city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, coming out from God. Coming out from my God. And you go back to the Psalm, Psalm 48. In Psalm 48, talking about Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. That goes beyond the Jerusalem on earth that you have seen. That the people of Israel were living in, in a... Psalms 48, verse, verse 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. In the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. And that's what uh, uh, the patriarchs of old, the people of old, the prophets of old, they looked ahead, they looked far ahead. And they saw that a new city will be coming. And that will be a city built by almighty God himself. That's why they endured their temptations. That's why they endured all their trials. That's why they didn't give up. That's why they didn't yield to any difficulty at their time. Yes, the conflicts were there. The persecutions were there. And the challenges were there. And the reason why those people never, they were not crushed. And they didn't crumble. And they didn't compromise. The reason is because they were looking for a city. The city that is made by the almighty God himself. Or the foundation that is made by the almighty God. New Jerusalem, a better place and a better country. And the place, the hearts of the people, even from the time of Abraham and the time of Isaac and Jacob and the time of the patriarchs and the people of God in the Old Testament, the time they were looking for. And even David spoke about it. If you have read Psalm 15 and Psalm 24, you will see that David spoke about it. And all the prophets that came after him speaking about this same thing, that's why their hearts were not in this world. 
That's why their minds were not buried in this world. That's why they were not tied to the things of this world. Because their heart was longing for that heavenly Jerusalem, heavenly city. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 10. For he looked for his city. He's talking about Abraham. He looked for his city, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And if you want to endure to the very end, be looking for that city. When you are tempted in your place of work, if you want to stand against that temptation, be looking for that city. Let it be in your mind. And understand, everything you see here, everything will soon vanish away. Everything you handle here, everything will soon vanish away. All the privileges or position you have here, everything you will soon evaporate into thin air. But the thing that will remain forever is this privilege of being in that new Jerusalem, in that new city, the city of God himself. And that's why Abraham, he was looking ahead. And he said, I'm not going to allow what Lot is doing to get me back and to get me looking at the wrong side of things. I'm going to keep on looking at that new Jerusalem, the place where the almighty God has prepared for his own people. Look at that verse 10 again. He looked for his city. He looked for his city, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Look at verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. That is, they were looking to at what they left behind. And they, and they were having a backward pull, dragging them. They would have backslidden. They would have gone back. But because they were looking forward unto the city of the great king of the great God that the Lord himself has prepared for them. That's why they didn't backslide. It says in verse 16, but now... They desire a better country, that is, and heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. We're told in chapter 12 of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading there from verse 22. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Chapter 13, verse 14. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Here we do not have any continuing city. Because whatever city you live in here, whether in the west or here in the tropics, everything is going to melt away. Everything is going to be destroyed. And that's why we're seeking one to come. And if you're seeking that to come, how do you seek that? You seek that by repentance. How do you seek that? You seek that by seeking the grace of God into your life. How do you seek that? You seek that by having a new heart, a new mind, a new life, a new, a new disposition. You seek that by becoming a new creature in Christ. You seek that by becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is only then when you are born again and you live in the experience of that new birth that you'll be able to enter through the gate into that city. We seek one to come. It tells us in Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 10 and from verse 11. Zechariah chapter 2, reading from verse 10. In verse 10 it says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And says the Lord. You remember what we were told in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3? God shall be their God, and God will dwell with them. In verse 11, and many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. A glorious day it will be. I pray you will be there. I said, I pray you will be there. In Revelation chapter 7, I'm reading from verse, uh, let me read from verse 9. Revelation chapter 7 from verse 9. And after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Of all nations and kindred, some people and tongues and stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and 
palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb and all the angels stood round about the throne and he bowed the elders and the four bees and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God saying Amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever everybody said Amen, Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence come, whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That's what is coming to the people of God and those who overcome sin, overcome self, overcome carnality, overcome the world, overcome Satan, overcome every opposition to the Christian life. Those are the people that will live there. And that's why we're coming to the Bible study. So that by the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, and by your yieldedness and commitment to the Lord, you'll be there in Jesus' name. We come to point number two, godly people in the new Jerusalem. The question is, who are the people that will be there on that final day? If you look at it from chapter 21, verse 4, chapter 21, verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from, the, from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Look at verse 7. Very important. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. What does that mean, all things? Shall inherit the new earth, all things, and the new heavens, all things, and the new Jerusalem, all things, and inheritance of the saints in heaven, all things. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Only the overcomers will have the privilege of living eternally in the new Jerusalem. That's not what we have read already. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. These are the believers through God's grace, and who through faith in Christ overcome. What do they overcome? It's there right there on your outline. Number one, they overcome sin. Number two, they overcome temptations, all their temptations. Number three, they overcome evil. Number four, they overcome persecution. Number five, they overcome false prophets. Number six, they overcome the world. Number seven, they overcome Satan. And please have all that in your mind. And when temptation comes to you in your place of work, in the marketplace, or in your home, or anywhere you find yourself, or in your business, when temptation comes to you, understand, the devil wants to take heaven away from you because the condition of getting to that new city, that heavenly city, that new Jerusalem, is to overcome. And if you're always yielding to temptation, always giving yourself to temptation, always being in the way of temptation, always being conquered and crushed by temptation, then you are not an overcomer. And should the trumpet sound any time, if the Lord does not find you an overcomer, you'll not be able to inherit that heaven, that new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth. Look at them one by one, what we are supposed to overcome. If we're going to be in that place, finally, uh, number one is sin. Look at Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, we're reading from verse 19. 
In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. If sin overcomes you, you come into the bondage of sin. That's what it says in verse 19. Of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The pollutions of the world that you escaped before, that you overcame before, that you were cleansed from, that you are set free from, if you are again entangled therein and you are overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have no need to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them, but it is happened unto them. According to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his vomit, to his own vomit again, and they saw the swine, the pig that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. If you allow sin to overcome you, and you remain conquered by that sin until Christ comes, you'll miss the rapture. We're told in Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 12. Romans chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 12. Here we learn, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Don't let sin overcome you. Don't let sin conquer you. Don't let sin overpower you. The temptation will come. It might come as a strong urge. Do it. That's what the devil will say. And your flesh might be pushing you. Do it. And your brain that has been corrupted, influenced by the devil, might be pushing you. Do it. If you go into it, you overcome by sin. But let not sin reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it in the loss thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness or sin. But yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. So number one, we overcome sin. Number two, we overcome temptations. Overcome temptations. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verse 26. Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 26. And, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And you understand this was written to those members of the church in Tatira. And you know the problem in Tatira, there was a Jezebel there. There was a woman in that church, luring people into fornication, into immorality enticing them, drawing them, pulling them into sin. And the Lord was telling those uh, people, yes, Jezebel is there. Yes, I'm going to judge her. And you leader, you pastor there, if you don't do your duty and deal with that woman, I'm going to deal with that church and all the children of that Jezebel. And then he said unto the rest of you, I'm not going to put any other burden upon you. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh the enticement and the temptation of the Jezebel. Then those are the people that I will give power over the nations. And it shall rule, in verse 27, it shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. Not only that you overcome sin and overcome temptation, number three, you overcome evil. Evil is running rampant in the land. And the examples of people might want to lure you into practicing the evil with them. But if you're going to get to heaven, you would overcome evil. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, we're looking at it from verse 17. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. What a challenge. In the place where you live, there will be unbelievers. They don't know any better. They can only do evil. Recompense to no man, evil for evil. In the place where you are walking, there are some people they don't know any better. They only practice evil. Recompense to no man, evil for evil. And among the people that are not born again, you meet them everywhere. 
and they are bent on doing evil. But make sure they, they, don't want to, they don't want to go to heaven. They don't even know about heaven. All they know is about this earth that is going to be rolled up and destroyed. But you know about heaven. You know about the new earth. You know about the new Jerusalem. You know about that holy city. You know about the place that the Heavenly Father is preparing for his own. You know about that better country, what Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. They don't know any better. And because they don't know any better, they will do evil. But you don't do the evil with them. Recompense to no man, evil for evil. That verse 17 says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And if it be possible as much as it lies in you, live peaceably with all men. That's going to be a great challenge. Because the people in your community, they are for war. They are for fighting. They are for hatred. They are for tearing things apart. And if you don't remember heaven, you're going to say, ah, you want to tear it apart? We're going to tear it apart. If you can do that, I can do it. You know you can't do it if you want to go to heaven. That you will not recompense, you will not pay them back in their coin. You live peaceably with all men, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if an enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap close coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You want to get to heaven? You want to have this place we're studying about to be yours. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Number four, we overcome persecution. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. It tells us very clearly here. It says, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that Ye may be tried, and that she may have tribulation ten days, but be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Overcome those persecutions. Don't be afraid. Persecutors will always be there, but don't be afraid of them. You will overcome in Jesus' name. Then number five, we overcome false prophets. First John chapter four. In first John chapter four. We're reading from verse 3. First John chapter 4 verse 3. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of the Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it shall come. And even now already is it in the world. Ye of God, little children, and have overcome them. Overcome them. Those false prophets or their false doctrine well, their invitation to you, don't go. Don't, don't yield to them. Overcome them. Overcome the false prophets. Then number six, you overcome the world. First John chapter five. In first John chapter five, verse four. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is see that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And then we're also to overcome Satan. First John chapter 2. We're reading from verse 13. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Overcome the wicked one. And then we're told in verse 14, I've written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you young men because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. If you're going to inherit that thing that has been prepared now, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. If you're going to inherit that, you're going to be an overcomer. We're told in 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, it tells us when we eventually inherit that new heaven and the new earth. 
And when we eventually overcome the last temptation, the last conflict, the last enemy, the last persecution, and the last challenge that the devil may throw upon us, when we eventually overcome, then we're going to get to that new Jerusalem, and we're going to inherit all things, and then what will be our experience when we get there? Look at chapter 21 of Revelation verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Are you weeping today because there's difficulty at home? A difficult husband? A difficult wife? Or a difficult uh, employer? Or difficult employees? Or difficult neighbors? And it appears they're making life terrible and tough and hard for you. Don't worry. It will soon come to an end. Because when we eventually get there, God shall wipe away all tears from your eyes in Jesus' name. And there shall be no more days, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write it down, write. For these words are true and faithful. And let's look at Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 25. We're looking at verse 8. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. And I'm telling us of what the Lord says he will do. What a glorious day that will be. In Isaiah chapter 35, reading from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return. And come to Zion with singing, with songs, and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And that's why uh, the beloved uh, apostle, uh, that is um, Paul the apostle, that's why he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading there from verse 9. It says, but as it is written, I has not seen, no ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. What eyes have not seen? That's what John was seeing. Yes, he had read about it in the word of God. Yes, he had heard about it from the Lord Jesus Christ. But now he saw it. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God. And coming out of heaven. And he said, I beheld it. And he saw the people that were there. And their tears were totally wiped away. We're told in Revelation chapter 22 verse 6. Revelation chapter 22 verse 6. And he said unto me, these saints are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy, angel, of the holy prophet sent his angel to show unto you, unto his servants, the things which must shortly come to pass. It will soon happen. In Revelation, this same chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 4. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their face forehead. In Ezekiel chapter 39 verse 8. Ezekiel chapter 39 reading from verse 8. Behold it is come and it is done says the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. The time will come eventually when we will see and when we will know and when we will enter in, and then we will be able to say what the word of the Lord in Ezekiel, Behold, it is come, and behold, it is done, says the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And then as we come back to uh, the Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, and you're looking at that verse 4. All through to verse 7. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Think about that. When death will be no more. 
and the pain of sickness will be no more. And the pain of bereavement or separation will be no more. Neither sorrow nor crying. There will be no loss of anything. Everything will be joy, will be happiness, will be gladness. There will be no sorrow, there will be no pain. Then he says, for the former things have passed away. All the things on earth that ever caused any pain, everything will vanish away. And then he said, he that sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, right, for these words are faithful and true. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is success of the fountain of the water of life freely. And then he tells us now, if you are longing and desiring, and if you are passionate wanting to be there, he tells us the kind of people that will be there, the people that overcome. He that overcometh, he that overcometh, the only people that will be there, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And that means then you need to make an effort. And you need to pray. And you need to give yourself to the Lord. And you need to get prepared so that you will be there. In First John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. First John chapter 3, looking at it from verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has loved, has bestowed upon us, that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. Beloved, now we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. I was a condition of getting there. Verse 3. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. How do you purify yourself as he is pure? If you have not known the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, the first step to take is to turn away from your sin. Sin makes us dirty. Iniquity makes us polluted. And unrighteousness makes us defiled in the presence of the Lord. And the very first thing to do is to turn away from that iniquity. Turn away from that unrighteousness. Turn away from that defilement. And when you turn away, you pray to the Lord. Because Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary. And he shed his blood for you. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ's son that cleanses us from all sin. And then when you are cleansed like that, that's salvation. You are born again. And all the external sins, outward sins, all those sins are taken away. But you are not through yet. There's still another sin. Then you go back to the Lord again to sanctify you, to purify you. You consecrate yourself to the Lord. You lay every sin upon the altar. Your heart, your spirit, your desires, your aspirations. Everything, you lay it upon the altar. You say, Lord, you gave yourself for me. I give myself to you and for you entirely and completely. That's the entire consecration. And then you tell the Lord, I know that you shed your blood so you can sanctify me. So you can purify me and make me holy. And then he does it. The work of grace in your heart. You are sanctified. You are purified. And then you keep in that purity. You keep in that sanctification. And if other people are doing something sinful uh, you know, around you, and they want you to come and be a partaker with them of their sins, say, no, I have a place I'm going. And in that place I'm going, sin will not be allowed there. I want to keep myself pure. Put your finger in First John chapter 3 and come to First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, we're looking at verse 22. Lay hands suddenly on no man. What that means is don't appoint anybody suddenly to spiritual responsibility. So you don't become a partaker of their evil. Neither be a partaker of other men's sins. There are people that will not stop sinning. And they may invite you to cooperate with them and to assist them or to uh, join them in doing their evil. Neither be a partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. That's what it will take. In First John chapter 3 verse 3, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Even as he is pure. 
And when that day will come, if you keep yourself in the love of God and the grace of God, on that final day, you'll be among the people of God that will be in the new Jerusalem. We come to Revelation chapter 21 and we're looking at verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and all mongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's a very serious thing. To start with, it tells us not everybody will be in the new Jerusalem. Not everybody will be in heaven. Not everybody will spend eternity with the almighty God in heaven because it says, but the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable and the murderers, the mongers and the sorcerers, and the idolaters and all that shall have their part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone. Not every church goer will be in heaven at last. Only those who are born again and they remain born again, they remain saved and they keep themselves away from the evil of the land and they remain overcomers in the Lord. You see what the Lord is telling us here after describing and stating very clearly in unmistakable terms those who will be admitted into the blessed heavenly holy city of God. The Lord now states explicitly those who would not be allowed to enter into heaven. And it gives us eight categories. Number one, the fearful. Number two, the unbelieving. Number three, the abominable. Number four, the murderers. Number five, the armongers. Number six, the sorcerers. Number seven, the idolaters. Number eight, all liars. Who are these? Let's look at them one by one. Number one, the fearful. That is, those who are so much afraid. They are afraid of husband. My husband will not allow me to get saved. They are afraid of wife. My wife will not allow me to keep to biblical conviction. They are afraid of their neighbors. My neighbors are going to make trouble with me if I give myself fully to the Lord. They are afraid of the gang members who they have been committing crimes together before. If I come out of the crime, they said they will deal with me. They are afraid of the villagers. The villagers said that your father had this idol. If you don't pick up this idol, we're going to deal with you. We're going to curse you. They are afraid. And because of that fear, they cannot follow the Lord. They cannot get saved. Or if they got saved before, they cannot remain in that salvation because of the fear of man. And the fear of man bringeth a snare. You will not be yourself. And you will not have any personal conviction. You will be doing everything even when you know it is wrong. Even when you know it will land you in hell. Even when you know it will make God to reject you. You will still do it because you are too much afraid of the people. What will they say? What will they do? How will they act? And I'm afraid of their punishment. And it can be very crushing, very disturbing. And I don't want to be able to stand and, and bear that. And those people who are so much afraid, you cannot stand by definite biblical conviction. Because of the fear of man, you'll not be able to get to heaven. That's what happened to Saul in First Samuel chapter 15. For Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He was a king, but he was not an independent man. He was a king, but he was not a confident man. He was a king, but he was not a self-reliant man. He was a king, but he wasn't a king of decision. He couldn't stand. He didn't have the boldness or the conviction to stand by what he knew to be right. I feared the people. And because I feared the people, that is why I did something that I knew I shouldn't have done. Are there not people like that? You are coming to church. When you come to church and you hear the word of God, you make up your mind. I will stand. I will stay. I will not go back into sin. I will not do evil. Then you go back to the office and they said, sign the sin. Oh, but this is fraudulent. This is a 419. I will not do this. What do you mean? Ah, uh, don't carry church here. If you carry church here, we are telling you, you are going to suffer for it. Okay, okay. Give me the paper. And then they sign. Then they say, God, you understand? I wanted to live right. I wanted to take my stand. 
These seven, I want to go there. But these people are too strong for me. And because of their fear, that's why I cannot stand. They'll take heaven away from you. Because the Bible says, the Lord Jesus said, the fearful. They will not be able to get to that place. Not ease to heaven. Uh, look at uh, in John chapter 9. John chapter 9. We're looking at verse 19. In John chapter 9 verse 19. This is the result of the fear of man. You see when you have the fear of man. You'll not have backbone. You'll not be able to stand. You'll not be able to say this is what I believe. And here is where I stand. Do whatever you will do. I'm going to stand on righteousness. You'll not be able to say 